So just to sort of complete one of the topics that we discussed briefly last time around, I am going to once again just take up a small example of the application of pipelining. And so that you have a clear idea of what is meant by the concepts that are used in order to actually implement pipelining. Right? So the example that we will consider is a simple two-tap finite impulse response filter. Okay? A fairly common signal processing type of application. So the in other words, the equation that we are trying to implement is something like this y of n is x of n plus some a times x of n minus 1. Okay, or rather a times x of n plus b times x of n minus 1. Okay. So in terms of the hardware implementation, this will look something like this. We have x of n over here. We have a register and as we discussed last time, at the output of the register, what we have is x of n minus 1. Okay. Now, obviously, the x of n and x of n minus 1 over here are not single bit values. They are probably going to be some numbers which are represented using 8 bits or 16 bits or some other number of bits. Okay. So, when I draw this line over here, it's not a single wire, it's actually a collection of wires, it's a bus. Okay. So, we'll take that as understood. And also this register that I am drawing over here is not a single register, it is actually a bank of 8 or 16 registers which are all sort of coupled together. Coupled together meaning the same clock signal is given to all of them. And then I treat them as one single unit so that when I give the input, correspondingly the output also comes synchronized with each other. Okay? Now, you need to keep in mind that in reality, each of those registers will have a slightly different delay. So, there will be some sort of shift between the delays that are coming through to the output. But, for our purposes right now, we will treat them as one single block. Okay? Alright. So, how do I implement this? X of n minus 1 needs to get multiplied by b. X of n needs to get multiplied by a. Now, once again, I am just putting a block over here saying it is a multiplier. Right? In reality, a multiplier itself will be composed of many adder blocks. The adders in turn will be composed of XOR gates, AND gates, OR gates and so on. So, this block that I am drawing over here as a multiplier is actually a fairly complex circuit. But the basic principles that we have been talking about so far will hold even over there. Right? Meaning that I can still associate a propagation delay with the multiplier as such, saying that once the inputs to the multiplier are ready, how much time does it take before the output of the multiplier settles to its correct value? In this case, of course, I have to take the worst case. I have to take, let's say, the inputs were 8 bits each, the output of the multiplier will be 16 bits. All 16 bits have to reach their final value before I can say that the multiplier output has settled to its correct value. Okay? Then I take both of these add them and I get y of x. Okay. Now let's consider a situation where a multiplier has a delay of 10 nanoseconds and an adder has a delay of let's say 5 nanoseconds. Okay. An adder has two inputs, a multiplier also has two inputs. In our case, the reason why I am not drawing the second input explicitly is, or rather I can just put this line over here. It is the A and B, the constant coefficient, which I use for multiplication. Right? So, this is an example of what we will do when we are designing digital circuits at an architecture level. That is to say, at a higher level than the transistor level or the logic level that we have been looking at so far. Okay? So, once we have designed it to this level, what we find is, we can straight away do the analysis that we had earlier. What is the maximum frequency or clock frequency at which this circuit can work? Assume that this is coming from some register, right? X of n itself is coming from some register outside. They are not part of the circuit that I am drawing, drawing over here. And similarly, this is in turn going to some other register that we also Okay. With this assumption, what is the maximum frequency at which this circuit can work? What is the critical path through this circuit, the longest path? Huh? 
one multiplier and one adder. Right? Because I have two paths essentially leading from the input or from a register to the output. Okay? From input to register, it essentially there is no combinational logic. Right? Input to output, there is one combinational path, which in this case passes through one multiplier and one adder. And from a register to output, that is from the x of n minus 1 register, through the multiplier b, through the adder to the output is also another combinational path. Okay? I am assuming that T to Q, T setup etc. is all zero for for condition. Okay. So under this condition, the operating clock period that can be used for this must be greater than or equal to 15 nanoseconds. This is the critical path. The critical path is the term used to indicate the longest combinational path through the circuit, which must be, I mean, the time that you give for the clock must be greater than that combination, longest combinational path so that the data can get computed correctly. Okay. Now, of course, the question becomes how do I reduce this? And for that, one of the things which I could think of doing is to say let me try and break the combinational path somewhere. Okay? So the question becomes can I just introduce a register over here which will at least break the input to output combinational path. Okay? Now what will happen is, this becomes only 10 nanoseconds, this becomes 5 nanoseconds, but I still have this path which is 15 nanoseconds. Okay? More importantly, introducing one register alone over here has sort of changed our logic. Because now what is being implemented as the adder? What I have over here is x of n minus 1. I call this sum b of n. Right, which is equal to a times x of n. This over here is going to be v of n minus 1, which means that what is being done by the adder is y of n is going to be equal to v times x of n minus 1 plus v of n minus 1. Right, but v of n is equal to a times x of n. So, v of n minus 1 is a times x of n minus 1. Assuming this is a time invariant system. Right? Substituting this back over there, what we get is y of n equals b x of n minus 1 plus a x of n minus 1. This is wrong. Why did that happen? Because we only introduced one register somewhere in the past. Okay. What you need to do when you are introducing registers like this for pipelining is to make sure that the path gets balanced. Both sides, if there is a branch somewhere, then on both sides of the branch you introduce registers. Okay. Which means that I could introduce another register here. Okay, if I put the blue register in place, what happens? Now, effectively, y of n becomes b times x of n minus 2 plus a times x of n minus 1. Okay? Is this a correct computation according to what we wanted earlier or not? What we wanted was y of n equals b x of n minus 1 plus a x of n. In this case, y of n becomes b x of n minus 2 plus a x of n minus 1. Are they both the same? Okay. So the point over here is because of the kind of operations that we have, essentially time invariant operations, both of these essentially refers to the same thing except that y of n is now shifted by one clock cycle. Okay. So, this in other words is correct. 
จะท้องวันปลอดภัยได้เกิดแต่ถ้าปีเดียวก็มาคอมพลีตลี่รอมคือเราจีนเนี่ยเอ็นทายร์ลี่รอมนี่คือเช่นแต่ถ้าจุดนั้นเราจีนเนี่ยก็ทาริกซี่คือเช่นโอเคโอเคดิสเพลสเมนต์ของการเรจิสเตอร์ฮัสนอตซอลด์อาร์ปรับเลมเพราะว่าสิ่งที่เราคิดถึงคือพาสต์ของสิ่งนั้นนั่นเองโอเคทุกอย่างที่เราควรจะทำคือเราควรจะบอกเป็นเพลสของเพลสเมนต์ของการเรจิสเตอร์ของอัพเทอร์มเพอร์ฟอร์แมนซ์วอร์ส1โอเคและ1โอเคเดอะดัชเลนด์ที่เราดรอนโอเคอร์จะเขียนให้เราเห็นว่าเราสไลซิ่งทรูเดอะอินเทอร์ฟอร์เวิร์ดพาร์ทของเซอร์เคิลอินสัตว์เวลาฉันสามารถเลือกเรจิสเตอร์ของทุกฟอร์เวิร์ดลุคินส์ฟังนี่คือปัญหาของฉันเพราะว่าทั้งหมดของฉันคือ a x ของฉันมินัส1 plus b x ของฉันมินัส2ซึ่งนี่คือถูก Okay. Critical path. What is the critical path in this case? One multiplier, ten nanoseconds. Okay. So from fifteen, I managed to reduce it down to ten. There is no obvious way by which I can reduce it below 10 without knowing what is inside the multiplier. Okay, if the multiplier is just given to me as a unit that I can use with a delay of 10 nanoseconds, that's it. There's nothing further I can do to reduce the delay below. This. Okay. Now, one thing which happens as a result of this is, let's say that the equation we were trying to implement was something slightly different. Y of n equals a times y of n minus 1. Plus b times x of n. Okay, there is now feedback in the circuit. So essentially, what happens is, if this is y of n, it goes through this, it goes through a multiplier. This is a times y of n minus one. This is one input to the adder. The other input to the adder is b times x of n. Okay. Now once again I have a critical path over here of 15 nanoseconds. Okay. But this circuit is a bit more tricky. What happens over here is if I try pipeline, if I introduce a register anywhere in this path, okay, or at least anywhere in the y of n minus one path. I am actually going to end up changing the functionality itself. Okay, so let's say that I try introducing a register over here. What I am doing as a result of this is that y of n becomes a times y of n minus two plus b times x of n, which is completely wrong. Right? This is implementing the wrong equation. Okay. Now this is something fundamental with your circuit in mind. Any time that you have feedback, then pipelining you have to be very careful about where you can apply it. Right? Here I can apply pipelining on the x of n path, which is only going forward. But the y of n, which is being fed back, if I try pipelining that, I am going to change the equation which I am implementing, and there is no way of correcting. There is no way to say that okay, look, I will just consider y of n plus one or something like that. In the previous case, what I could say is, y of n has this equation, a x of n minus one plus b x of n minus two. So y of n plus one, if I define a new variable as y of n as you know, v of n equals y of n plus one, that v of n will have the correct values x of a times x of n plus b times x of n minus one. Right? Just by sort of redefining the variables, I can get the values correct. In this case, there is no way to do that. Because y of n itself has got delayed by an extra clock cycle before being multiplied. Okay. 
So this is something fundamental that you need to keep in mind. Pipelining of the sort that we discussed can only be applied for circuits that are of a feed forward side. Okay, everything is going only in one direction. The moment that you have feed back, you need to be very careful. The normal pipelining that we discussed cannot be applied. There are other tricks that can be done, but they are beyond the scope of this course, so I am not going to go into it here. Okay? Alright, so now that sort of ends our discussion of pipeline. Yeah. Huh? Can you delay X of N? Yes, you can delay X of N. Delaying X of N is not a problem, but right now the moment I have introduced this blue register, Y of N is wrong. No matter what I do, it doesn't matter. Because the relationship between y of n and y of n minus 2 has already gone wrong. y of n should have been dependent only on y of n minus 1, not on y of n minus 2. No, you cannot delay y n. Right? Then what will happen out here is, so what you are saying is put a register here and consider this as, okay, so this is y n, this is y n minus 1. Fine, delay x n also. Right? So what ends up with this is y n equals a times y n minus 2 plus b times x n minus 1. Right? And this final value over here y n minus 1 will become a times y n minus 3. plus d x n minus 2. Remember, everything that is coming through to this point is getting delayed. So all the computations that you have done, the y n delayed by a certain amount and then multiplied by a, that is itself getting delayed. So effectively the computation of the final value y n minus 1 that you are looking at will be related to y n minus 3, not to y n minus 2 which is what you want. This is something fundamental. You are changing the number of delay elements inside that loop. There is no way that you can recover from that without doing some other sort of changes to the circuit changes to the system. Okay. Alright. Now, in terms of terminology, right? There is one particular term that is frequently used in the context of timing analysis, which is flat. Okay. Now, flat, what it says is, let's say that this is your circuit. This is the clock, this is some combinational logic and two registers. Okay, I am giving you some value of t, right, let's say that I have given equal to 20 nanoseconds, okay, the combinational logic delay I will say is 5 nanoseconds, okay, the TQ is 3 nanoseconds, T setup is equal to 2 nanoseconds, T hold is also equal to 2 nanoseconds. Okay? Under these conditions, the question becomes is there any extra delay that can be given in the combinational logic and still the circuit will work correctly? Okay. Is it possible for the combinational logic to have some additional delay beyond this 5 nanoseconds which I have got over here right now and still the circuit will work correctly? Okay. In this case, it is quite obvious that there is, right, I can increase the combinational logic delay beyond 5 nanoseconds and still get correct operation. Question is, how far can I increase it? Okay. So, we define this term called flag as T minus T 
टी सी क्यू माइनस टू कॉम्बिनेशनल लॉजिक माइनस टी सेटअप है ओके सो वॉट इज इन दिस केस इट इज ट्वेंटी माइनस फाइव माइनस फाइव माइनस टू सो दिस इज इक्वल एट नाइन ऑफ एट राइट वॉट यू आर से दिस मच इज अवेलेबल एज फ्लैट ऑन द सर्विस ऑन दैट पार्ट फ्लैट इज यूजली वेन यू आर प्रेसिंग द रोड राइट इफ यू से दैट दर इज फ्लैट इन द रोड वॉट इट मीन्स इज दैट यू कैन फाइट एन इज अ बिट फर्स्ट Right, you can pull the rope a bit more and make it, and only then it will become soft. Otherwise, it has got some amount of extra material over there, which will just be hanging there. Right? In this case, up to eight nanoseconds of time is available as extra because your clock period was given as twenty nanoseconds. If the clock period had been fifteen nanoseconds, then only three nanoseconds of time is available as extra. If the clock period had been given as twelve nanoseconds. Then there is no slack at all, zero slack. And if the clock period has been given as 10 nanoseconds, the slack is negative. There is something wrong with the circuit. Okay. So this definition of slack, in this case, of course, I have just defined it with respect to. So how did I get to this notion of slack? What I said is the time that the data starts from here goes through the combinational logic through the setup time. In the meantime, the next clock twice has to come and reach over here. Okay, so this is the time for the clock. This is TCQ. This is combinational logic. This is setup. Okay. Now we can take this one step further and say. Look, supposing instead of just saying a propagation delay associated with a gate. I also tell you explicitly what is the minimum and maximum delay associated with every piece of logic. Right? So the minimum delay associated with the logic is telling you the earliest time when the output can start changing as a response to a given input. Okay? In this case, let's say that I give the clock at some time zero over here. Okay. So the clock rises at the first flip flop at time t equal to zero. Q of flip flop one changes. I don't know whether I don't care whether it goes up or down. In this case, I'll consider the latest possible time when it can change. Max value of TCQ, right? TCQ also could have a min value and a max value, possibly, right? Depending on whether it's a zero to one or one to zero transition, it's possible that the data changes and that the delay from clock to queue is going to be slightly different. Okay. The input of flip flop two changes at T C Q max plus T combinational logic again max, right? And the guard interval that I need to leave for correct operation means T C Q plus T combinational logic. Plus T theta. Okay, this is the data arrival time. Or sorry, up to here without the theta time is the data arrival time at SS2. Right? We call this the late. Data arrival time at SS2 because it is the latest point in time when it can reach because I have taken all the maximum days. 
right? Similarly, there can be an early clock arrival time. In this case, what is the early clock arrival time? It is just T, the T clock itself. But in general, if there has been a buffer on the clock path, then that delay corresponding to the buffer would have got added. Okay? Whatever is the minimum delay corresponding to that buffer would also have got added to it. Okay? I will call this the T clock path. Okay, buffer delay. Now, for a setup violation to not happen, what we are effectively saying is the latest time when the data reaches plus the guard interval must still be less than the earliest time at which the clock generates. Okay. Or writing it in another way, the slash can be written as the time of the early arrival of the clock So the earliest point at which the clock arrives minus the latest point at which the data arrives minus the guard interval. Okay. So this effectively tells us if this number is positive, what it means is that the earliest time at which the clock can arrive is going to be after the late data reaches at that flip clock. Okay, and of course you have also left the guard interval. So in other words, the positive flash is good. It means that your data is going to be before the clock signal arrives. Okay, the latest possible arrival of the data is before the clock signal arrives at the flip clock. Okay. Similarly, I can also have another condition for the whole time. For the whole time, what I'm saying is. Now what I want to know is the clock has arrived here at some point in time. The clock will arrive here at that plus TCP, the clock path. Okay. Now what I actually want to see is for the same clock cycle, right? I have given one clock over here. The data will come through this. It will go through the combinational logic. It should not change until the whole time of flip flop 2 has passed. Okay? So I need to make sure that the delay to this, the TCQ plus T, the TCQ, the minimum delay through TCQ plus the minimum delay through the combinational logic must be greater than or equal to T hold plus the clock path. The maximum delay through the clock path. In the other case, we were talking about the early clock, or here we are talking about the late clock. Right? So, what does this mean? The clock arrived at flip-flop 2 late. 
because it took the maximum delay path through the buffer okay after that time that it arrived at flip flop 2 i need to leave a margin of three holes before i can allow the data to change when does the data actually change the clock arrives at flip flop 1 at time 0 and the output of flip flop 1 at ttq min the minimum delay through that flip flop when does it arrive at the input of flip flop 2 ttq min plus ttl min the combinational logic okay so that is the earliest data that can arrive at the next flip flop versus the latest clock that can arrive at the next flip flop okay so the clock code here can be defined as ccq min plus t combinational logic min minus t whole minus t clock max if this number is positive it means you don't have a hold violation if the number is negative it means that you have a hold violation your data has changed before the hold interval on the second flip flop has elapsed okay so in reality what you will find is that all of timing analysis comes down to a set of the so called hold set up and hold assertion right assertion meaning somebody says okay you know this condition has to be satisfied at this place that's called an assertion or a constraint right and all of those constraints are usually written in terms of can can be rewritten in terms of class so ultimately timing analysis boils down to the question of how do i compute class at every point in the circle and find out whether it is positive or negative as long as class everywhere is positive things are perfect the circuit will just work well if flat anywhere is negative it means there is either a setup or a hold violation at that point and things can go wrong okay all right so like i said today is jumping around among a number of related but slightly different topics the third topic that i want to take up now is so call i mean essentially timing when you consider logic circuit implementation using latch right transparent latches instead of edge trigger flip flop okay so an edge trigger flip flop essentially says there is some logic to be implemented right the same clock is given to all the flip flops so effectively the t must be greater than or equal to max of t cl1 and t cl2 right as long as you have that the circuit will work correctly right this is for x zero now for level trigger things are slightly different the first thing that we need to consider is how do we implement a level triggered latch a uh, latch based system let's say that i give one phase of the clock over here i give some combinational logic and over here i give the other phase of the clock so if this one was if phi 1 was 0 at some time phi 2 should be 1 during that time and vice versa okay next piece of combinational logic again i use phi 1 right so effectively one way of thinking about this is is to say that i took the master slave configuration where there was phi 1 immediately followed by phi 2 Split it up and put logic in between the two states. Right? That's sort of what it looks like. What I've done over here. Okay. Now let's consider how this this kind of circuit behaves. Right?
you have these two clocks, five one and five two, which are being given to the latches respectively. The combinational logic. So what happens at five one? Essentially, what we are saying is the first stage of combinational logic. I'll call this L one, L two, and L three the latches. L one becomes transparent as soon as five one becomes equal to one. Okay. Which means the moment that phi one becomes equal to one, some data has now fed into L one, and L one will start. The C L one will start computation. What do I mean by start computation? It means that whatever combinational logic is there will become active because you have applied new inputs to it, and that will go through that combinational logic. Okay. So C L one becomes active immediately after L one allows the data to go through from input to output. Okay. After some time, it finishes its work. L1 is over here. CL1 takes a certain amount of time. Then L2 becomes active. Okay. And it takes a certain amount of time before. L3 once again becomes active. Okay, so our normal constraint that we would like to see is CL1 starts when phi1 goes high. If it finishes. Before phi one goes low, then C L two can start when phi two goes high. Okay, that's what I've drawn in this diagram over here, right? So C L one took a certain amount of time, let's say five nanoseconds, but the time until which you know C L phi two becomes high. Only at 10 nanoseconds, let's say. Okay, so this is taken from 5 nanoseconds. There is some 5 nanoseconds of gap over here, flat, and only then 5 to changes at 10 nanoseconds. Similarly, let's say that CL2 took 7 nanoseconds. There is a 3 nanosecond gap. This will change at 20. Right? And everything works perfectly the way that we would expect to. Okay. So this is one way by which I can operate. I can take the master-slave combination of the register, break it up into master part and slave part, and say I will put logic in between both of those. Okay? Yeah. Correct. Correct. So that's a good point. Right now, what we are assuming over here is that the input has already stabilized before phi one becomes high. Okay. Now, I'm going to break that assumption. Right. But instead of changing phi one, what I'm going to say is, let's consider a situation where phi one comes at zero. C L one now takes a long time. How long? Let's say it takes 12 nanoseconds. Okay. I feed that output to phi two, but phi two still remains as before at 10 nanoseconds. Okay. So what happened? Phi two became active. That is, it started allowing data through into the combinational logic C L two from time t equal to 10 nanoseconds. Okay, but the data is still changing because C L one has not finished. So until time, so between time 10 nanoseconds and 12 nanoseconds, some data is coming through phi two, going into the combinational logic, doing some computation over there, but is actually wrong. Because the data at the input C L one has not yet settled to its correct value. Okay, 
let's see whether the overall operation still comes out correctly what you are saying is after phi 2 cl2 like before take 7 nanoseconds so what happens over here phi 2 is transparent all the way from 10 nanoseconds to 20 nanoseconds that entire duration phi 2 is going to be transparent so even though the input data was changing up to 12 right it allowed it into the combinational logic. Now that combinational logic was faster. TL2 is fast. It takes only 7 nanoseconds to finish. This means that by 19 nanoseconds I have actually finished everything. Okay. I still have a 1 nanosecond gap before the next 5 1 arrives here at 20 nanoseconds. Right? Effectively, what has happened over here is that bunch of logic which I had between phi1 and phi2, L1 and L2 was allowed to take more than 10 nanoseconds. It was effectively allowed to borrow some time into the next half clock cycle. Okay? So this what has happened over here is termed as time borrowing. Effectively what has happened is the CL1, the combinational logic 1 has split over into the time that was actually allotted for CL2. It has borrowed some time from CL2. But the overall circuit still works correctly because CL2 is able to finish in time. Okay, and by the time the next clock edge, uh, the phi one that is L three becomes transparent. Once again, everything is okay. Now, even that was not really necessary, right? I could have had a situation where this is phi one. This takes fifteen nanoseconds. phi 2 takes 10 nanoseconds the next phi 1 over here still works correctly so what has happened is First combinational logic block computed all the way from here up to somewhere over here. Right? During the time phi 2 is already active. Right? It starts computing. goes into the time that is actually allotted for the next chain. So it has spilled over. Right? So overall what can happen is the only important thing that has to happen is the second phase TL2 has to finish before this end. Why? Because if it does not finish by this time, phi 2 will become okay. No further data will be allowed to go into the logic. Or rather, phi 1 will become okay and will not allow whatever changes you have got to come through so that the next phase, TL3, can start working on it. Okay? So, up to half a clock cycle of time can be borrowed from the previous phase by using this kind of last phase design. Okay? In some sense it makes your design a bit more flexible than what you could do with H trigger flip flop. Right? In H trigger flip flop you have to make sure that something starts at an edge. By the time the next edge arrives at the other flip flop, it has to complete. These are known as hard barriers. Right? But in the case of the last 
it becomes transparent at a certain time and then becomes opaque sometime later. Any time within that window it is sufficient if the data comes through and starts computing. Okay? All you have to do is make sure that before the next flash, after that, becomes opaque and stops allowing any of the computed values to go through, you finish your work. That gives you one half clock cycle of time extra. Okay? So this is the trick that can be used in the case of large space design. Sequ uh, sequential logic is implemented using transparent flashes can make use of this technique, time borrowing. Right? But in general, it's not a very, I mean, it is perfectly usable. In fact, it is used in many kinds of designs. The problem is it's a bit more difficult to make it automatic. The timing analysis and so on becomes a bit more difficult when you have this kind of time borrowing. You can, of course, still define the same kind of setup constraint. Except that for a lag, where does the setup and hold constraint hold? Where do you have to apply those constraints? At the rising edge or falling edge of a lag? Or is it somewhere during the transparent time? See, what does setup and hold constraint basically tell you? It means that after this point in time, the clock is sort of making the system opaque, no further changes. Very close to that point in time, I should not have any changes just before or just after the clock. For an edge trigger flip flop that's easy, there is only one point at which it changes, the edge. So just before the edge is set up time, just after the edge is hold time. Don't change the data close to that margin. But for a lag, things are slightly different. What it's saying is, just before the edge, just before the falling edge for a positive lag, that is a lag which is transparent when the input or the clock is high. Just before the falling edge is when it becomes when it is becoming okay. Right? Just before the falling edge, you need to leave one setup margin. Just after the falling edge, you need to leave a hold margin. In other words, as far as the last is concerned, you can keep on changing the data anytime that you want inside the transparent window. But when it is going to become opaque, you have to leave a margin, a guard margin over there. Okay? Alright, so this pretty much winds up the discussion that we had on various aspects of timing. I've uploaded an assignment on the Moodle which also has a couple of questions related to this. And sometime next week I'll also upload some few more questions that you can use an assignment just for practice for the exam. Okay. Apart from the tutorial, there is also a five simulation assignment which has been uploaded. Right? That is due next next Monday, so that is October 5th. Okay? So please keep in mind that the spice assignments are part of your grade. I have noticed that some people have not submitted the spice assignment for assignment 1. You will lose marks. Okay? Please submit even if it is late, you will at least get partial credit for it. But if you don't submit anything, you get a zero on that particular assignment. Okay? The tutorials are different. The tutorials are not graded, they are just meant for practice, for you to work on the exam essentially, to help you with the type of questions that are likely to show up on the exam. Okay? And also in some cases the tutorial covers questions where we have not had time to go through it in detail in class. Okay? So both of those have been uploaded on Moodle. Please take a look and make sure that you go through those things soon over the weekend and the next coming weeks.